New York City to be here. And uh, as you all come on back in here, we're just going to turn it over to Mark and uh, strap in. Thank you, Rick. Uh, feel free to eat, do whatever you want to do during the presentation. So this is going to be a little bit different because NAB 2018, I thought it was not just about the technology. Here's a shot of the show floor. Where have all the people gone? Well, this is Thursday, which is the last day. Uh, but the number of exhibitors was up more than 13 percent. The attendance was down 10 percent. So more exhibits, fewer people, fewer people per exhibit. Why? Well, if you go to NAB, you can network in person and you can see things like that camera rig if you want to see whether that fits you. If you don't go to NAB, you network online, places like LinkedIn. Uh, you see boxes, a box is a box, and software online and you avoid the travel in the crowds. This is another wild thing. I saw this coming down the aisle at me one day and yikes. Uh, this is an actual email to me from an exhibitor after the show. Hi, Mark, another crazy NAB show. Sorry we weren't able to hook up. No matter what we're doing is software-based anyway. <laughs> and it was indeed a crazy NAB show. Uh, last year, I told you that two pages of the NAB show daily news were devoted to food menus. This year, it was four pages. Um, various people talking about top picks at the show. And here's one of, one of the reporter's top picks. Harmonic, great company, makes lots of great products. Manufacturer of encoders and processors had the best free food. <laughs> so they talked about the best free food, the thickest carpets, the prettiest booths, the coolest motto. But just about everybody picked out two things at the show as among their top picks. And one was a camera holding robot, and the other was an autonomous vehicle. So this is the camera holding robot, and if you want to see it in operation, there's a uh, YouTube link. By the way, all these slides are currently available to you online, uh, and I had the link at the beginning. I'll have it again at the end so you can write it down. Very simple link. Uh, it moves really fast. So they had one of these in another location near the front entrance, and people were dancing with it. Um, and this was somebody's comment about the camera holding robot. Out with booth babes and in with booth bots. Yes, sounds good. Um, but this is not really something that everyone is going to deal with. That one's $275,000. Uh, that one's $200,000. That's just for the camera holding part, not the camera itself. And there were other booths with robots. Uh, this is at the DJI booth. I'll give you more about DJI in a moment. Here is another DJI product that you might not think of as something that DJI normally deals with. And here's that other thing that everyone was impressed with, an autonomous vehicle uh, that was taking people around outside, and you could watch ATSC 3.0 broadcasts inside the vehicle. So here's a report from one of uh, my favorite reporters, Adam Wilt, about it, and he confirmed there was never any breakup on any of the screens. However, the vehicle got confused and stopped, and someone had to get out a joystick game controller and joystick the vehicle past the area that it was having a problem with. He's sure there's deeper meaning, but he's not sure what that is. <laughs> so technologies at NAB versus the P's. Some of the big technologies, artificial intelligence, ATSC 3.0, compression, direct view cinema, drones, 8K, and HDR. Some non-technology P's, pedagogy, perception, policy, politics, posture, pricing and profit, and progress. So let's take a look at ATSC 3.0 in that regard. From a technology standpoint, it's fantastic. Um, the bit rate is variable up to 57 megabits, much more than ATSC uh, 1.0. The signal to noise ratio, it'll operate down to minus 5.5 dB signal to noise ratio. 
um, up to four variable pipes. So you can have one that has high capacity and one that's extremely robust, many different coatings, including HEVC, uh, which has perhaps four times the efficiency of the MPEG-2 that we're dealing with now, so great stuff. But then there's the non-technology part, the policy and progress. So when ATSC came out, the government mandated the transition and funded it. That little red thing there is a card that you could get for the government. They would pay $40 towards your receiver. A uh, single broadcaster could do a transition because everyone got another channel. Reception was mandated. You couldn't sell a TV set that didn't have an ATSC tuner. As far as other sources, uh, cell phones, 2G cellular was about the best you could do at the time. Uh, you were lucky if you could get a voice call on it. There was essentially no over-the-top transmission. Today, the government has permitted ATSC 3.0, but that's it, just permitted it. If you guys get together as broadcasters and say, okay, we're going to have one broadcaster carry a bunch of uh, the signals in, in ATSC and then another broadcaster carry a bunch in 3.0, uh, that's fine, but then you have to do that for five years. Reception is voluntary. You can sell a TV set without an ATSC 3.0 uh, receiver. 5G is now deploying in the mobile space and over the top is soaring. The, uh, reports are that revenues for over the top have exceeded broadcast. So that transition is going to be tricky. And then here's um, another group saying, hmm, there's an error and needs to be fixed. A little bit more on policy. This doesn't look like policy, it looks like a drone. And here is a report from Drones Globe on market share. So in this segment, $500 to $1,000 range, uh, DJI has a 72% market share. I think that's more than the share of flights that American has in Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. Uh, how about more expensive drones, over 1,000? DJI has a 70% market share. And what is this company called DJI? Well, DJI stands for Dajiang Innovations of Shenzhen, Guangdong, China. Uh, so that's technology. And then we have, uh-oh, um, maybe we don't like Chinese technology in the United States. Um, ZTE, China's second largest telecommunications company out of business based on a Department of Commerce ban. And then, surprise, um, oh, we want to protect Chinese jobs, so let's do something about that. And then, surprise, a couple days later, uh, maybe we don't want to do that. Um, so, hmm. Um, what about Congress? Well, they've got their own ideas. They say, whatever the administration does, we want to block deals with China. Um, here's somebody saying that ZTE phones have been spying on us. What does that have to do with our business? Well, here's a memo about DJI drones spying on us. How about the cloud? Um, it's a question of capital expenditure versus operating expenses. Um, but here's a market share thing. Now, this is not quite as much as DJI. It's not 72% or 70%, but Amazon has pretty close to half of the cloud. Now, why does Amazon have that much? Well, for one thing, they've got some terrific pricing. If you want to store things in Amazon's cloud, this is their lowest uh, priced storage, and it's uh, four-tenths of a cent per gigabyte per month or about $4 per terabyte per month. Uh, not bad. And hey, what could go wrong with Amazon? Well, it isn't just China that people are concerned with as far as policy is concerned. And here's something that sounds like it might be unrelated, but here's a story about streamers, and 20% are sharing their credentials. So if you are doing over the top and you're trying to charge for that, um, people are sharing their credentials. I guess that's the P for that one is pals. Hey, here, pal, use my credentials. Well, there's something that came out at NAB, but not on the show floor, that might be able to address both of those issues, the Amazon and the 20% of streamers sharing credentials, and it's blockchain. Blockchain is the technology behind cryptocurrencies, but it can be used for other purposes, including storage on the web. So here's a company called SIA. Um, they're 
uh, website is SIA.tech, and they have this other website that gives statistics about how much their storage costs. I mentioned Amazon was very low at $4 per terabyte per month. Uh, these guys on April uh, 12th, which was the last day of NAB, $1.31 per terabyte per month. And they're storing it on computers all around the world. Only 30% of them have to restore for you to be able to recover your data. Uh, so blockchain sounds really terrific, um, but then there was this headline in the New York Times, uh, the Russians saying, we're going to take over blockchain. So more about progress at the show. Here's a wireless intercom system from Riedel. It's their Bolero, which they showed previously, but this has been upgraded, got lots of new features, really terrific, wonderful technology. But there has been progress. And so here's another company at the show, uh, Unity Intercom, and they just use ordinary uh, phones, either iPhones or uh, Android phones, not a problem. They do six-channel intercom. Uh, they do tally. If your switcher has a preview tally, they'll do the preview tally as well. And because people have phones, there's all kinds of other things that can be done. Why have call-in shows that are audio only when you can have call-in shows that are video as well? I showed you this last year about um, SMPTE 2110. Much of the conference today is about that, so I won't say much, except here's a slide from uh, SMPTE President Matthew Goldman at a sports video group conference on IP, showing how much is already approved and published. And you heard a little bit about the uh, IP showcase at NAB, more than 50 vendors, uh, plug and play, everything was working great. So maybe IP is normal now. Well, Carl told you some reasons why that might be an issue, but this one was an interesting uh, one for me. Um, I'm showing the search box for LinkedIn so you can search for it the same way David Ross SDI. And he says, is IP really appropriate for every single project? Maybe I just have to vent for a second, but bear with me. It's worth reading what he has to say about that. So uh, compression, uh, very significant for ATSC 3.0, as I pointed out before, uh, can be significant for IP. We've heard about MPEG-2, about a two-to-one efficiency improvement going to MPEG-4 AVC, also known as H.264, about another two-to-one uh, efficiency improvement going to HEVC or H.265. And now they're already talking about what goes beyond that. Uh, VVC is what they're calling it, the versatile video codec, which might be H.266. And Fraunhofer was showing their version of it. And meanwhile, there's HEVC versus alternatives, uh, the VNOVA Perseus, Real Networks RMHD, and AV1, which I'll tell you more about later. So this is all still technology, great stuff. Um, but here's a rant from Leonardo Chiarleone, who's the uh, father of MPEG, if you will. And um, he says, what the heck is going on here? We engineers are coming up with this great stuff, and then people are screwing around. And here's um, something from Elicard, which was an NAB exhibitor. They call themselves the video compression guru. And it explains what the issue is uh, for... MPEG LA, the licensing authority, they came up with a bunch of the patents and they came up with a pretty decent license. But then another group, HEVC Advance, added some more licenses and they wanted more money. And they wanted money for content. And then Technicolor said, oh, we're gonna do our own thing, completely separate from both of those. So pricing and profits have maybe screwed up HEVC and thus the Alliance for Open Media, founded by, oh my God, Amazon, Cisco, Google, Intel, Microsoft, Mozilla, Netflix, that's the founders. And then there's a long list of members, I've just put some of them on there, including Adobe and AMD and so on. The technology is based on the Google VP10 base, and then some elements of Cisco's Thor and Mozilla's Dalla, it's open source, it's royalty free, but Matt Frost of Google says it's evolutionary improvements on, among others, 
H.264 and HEVC. But those have those licensing authorities. So if you're doing an improvement on that, are you going to be sued? So they've put together a legal defense fund. No problem. Hey, you know, feel free to sue Amazon, Cisco, Google, Intel, Microsoft, Mozilla, and Netflix. Be my guest. Except we have this issue. Some of you may remember Star Wars Episode Two came out in 2002. It was the first movie to be shot electronically at 24 frames per second, first major movie. It was actually the, the third to use 24p. And somebody had a patent for 24p. Whether it was a defensible patent is hard to say, but they said, we're going to prevent the opening of this movie if you don't cave and buy a license for our patent. Now, Sony could have fought them in court, but what about the opening of the movie? So the better thing to do for business was to protect the patrons, and they bought a license. Um, this was an interesting compression thing. JPEG XS, which you may or may not have heard of, uh, versus JPEG 2000, What's strange about it is it actually has reduced compression efficiency. It's not as good a compression system as JPEG 2000. So why do we want it? Well, uh, very low complexity. Any device can decode it. High performance, low latency, less than one line. You know, a switcher can bring it back into timing. Um, high quality, error robust, and so on. So that's at Fraunhofer, also Intopix, other people were talking about it. And then there was this other compression system unveiled at the show, Apple ProRes RAW, and this is from their white paper, and you can see that there's a tremendous reduction in bitrate, and uh, there were exhibitors at the show who were already saying, oh, we have products that are compatible with ProRes RAW. How about 3D? Uh, a few years ago, we all thought we were going to have to do 3D in the home and 3D broadcasts. Even in the cinemas now, it has hit an eight-year low. Uh, 1.3 billion revenue share of 12% down from 2.2 billion and 21%. Um, preference, maybe? Pricing? Hard to say. But 3D's uh, offspring, VR, and AR seems to be doing very well, and where are they doing it? In movie theaters, but not in the auditoriums, outside the auditoriums. Um, so here is a story about an eSports arena um, that's for VR and AR, but other people are doing things in lobbies of movie theaters because you can have a very fancy VR uh, 4D rig is what they sometimes call it, where you get also some feeling, maybe some heat when there's a heat thing, or some wind in your hair, or something like that. Now here's something I showed you in 2016, the Nokia Ozo camera, and then last year Nokia said, well, we're out of that business. Um, but what was exciting to me at Fraunhofer is they've now gone and sort of turned this thing inside out. So they have what's called a volumetric video studio. And instead of having a typical VR camera where there's a whole bunch of cameras around a sphere or a cylinder or something, they have a cylindrical studio with a whole bunch of cameras looking in. And what you can do with this is create a VR movie where you don't just put on the headset and move your head around, you can walk around. You can walk around characters and see what they're seeing and uh, go look at what the other character is doing. And Fraunhofer was offering that. It was extraordinary. It was an amazing experience, better than any VR I've encountered. Uh, so there's one of the actresses in the studio. This was done for the 100th anniversary of the uh, German uh, film studio UFA. And down at the bottom, you may recognize that T logo as the parent company of T-Mobile. And T-Mobile was loved at the show. It was amazing. The wireless mic people were saying, T-Mobile has just been doing wonderful stuff, keeping us informed of what transitions are going. Uh, they collaborated with PBS to save translators, so uh, really great. But back to VR, this was at NHK's booth, 
and um, they had safe VR, so you had to put on a face shield before you would hold on to this 8K uh, VR system. The 8K part of it was terrific. The VR part was not so great. If you moved it a little bit, it went jerk, jerk, jerk. Um, but hey, 8K is moving along. NHK had a camera good to 240 frames per second. Sharp had what looked like a regular camcorder, so normal type cameras. Easy connections. This 240 frame per second 8K camera, uh, NHK said, oh, it just takes two SDI connections. And sure enough, it looked to me like there were two SDI connectors there. Wow, that's amazing. Um, but then I looked more deeply into the SDI connectors. They call it USDI. Each of the connectors has 24 fibers in it. <laughs> so there's 256 gigabits per second per connector. Um, so 512 gigabits per second. Ethernet isn't quite up to that yet. Uh, how do you watch 8K? Well, here's one way. Um, so Astro had a great thing in their booth. They call it um, digital opera glass. So you have an 8K production and you transmit it to your mobile phone and obviously you don't get to see 8K on the mobile phone, but you just touch an area of the screen and presto, it zooms in. Um, so that was kind of interesting, but hey, is 8K the end? Nah, there we have 10K on the left and Intel was showing 16K. Um, here was a display that I showed you last year. It was Sony's Canvas, uh, beautiful display. Um, this year, as best I can del tell, the main thing they did was change the name from Canvas to Crystal LED. Uh, but spectacular technology, unquestionably the best uh, display at the show, 32 foot wide, uh, high dynamic range, just blasted away anyone who was looking at it. But um, if you had a picture something like this, where the center of the picture was in focus because of uh, depth of field or something like that, and you were off looking at the left side of the screen, ew, that didn't feel very good. So here are some viewing tests based on a 56 inch screen, just to show that um, going from HD to 4K, definitely perceptible, definitely an improvement, not a big one though. Going to higher frame rate, big improvement going to higher dynamic range, very big improvement. So here is that Sony Crystal LED and it pops. The pictures just pop right out, they're really terrific. Um, all I did in this next picture was change the brightness uh, on my display or in my file so you can see there's a lot of dynamic range there. So this, people are talking about, hey, let's do this in cinemas, a heck of a lot better than projection. And sure enough, there's an organization now called the Cinema Emissive Display Association. Um, but some issues in terms of pricing and perforations that Sony um, Crystal LED system, um, 32 feet wide, one price that was mentioned at the show for each panel of it, which is 18 inches by 16 inches, $34,000. Um, so to get to 32 feet wide, there's a lot of patterns, uh, panels involved. Another issue is perforations. We currently in cinema have the speakers behind the screen. Um, this is solid, doesn't necessarily have to be. There's lots of room as I'll show you in a moment, but something to be dealt with. So this was a story in the Hollywood Reporter how the new LED cinema screen <coughs> could change filmmaking and movie going. And I'd say, yeah, oh boy, can it change it. Um, if you are interested in high dynamic range, get hold of this paper from the SMPTE Journal, uh, May, June 2016, how independent are HDR, WCG, and HFR in human visual perception and the creative process. So here's just one, um, set of charts from that paper, and I've added the red and green lines where 24 frames per second and 60 frames per second are. Um, so notice that if you have a dim image on the left, 24 frames per second is fine. But if you have a bright image, 1,000 nits um, near the top, um, 24 frames per second will show you flicker and so you need to go to something like 60 frames per second. 
And then on the right, notice the field of view. So if you're watching traditional HD with a 30 degree field of view and you have 60 images per second, no problem. But if you get to this 32 foot wide screen that you're watching from three feet away, uh, problem maybe even at 60 frames per second. So here's a close up of that screen. And I was mentioning before that perforation shouldn't be an issue. The smallest dot that you can see here is the size of the actual emissive element. So plenty of room to put in perforations. And you wouldn't notice them because you don't notice them on the screen. It's a really terrific picture. But notice that as the things get brighter, the dots appear to be bigger. They're not. The LED doesn't change size. Now, I'm not sure how much of this is due to the coating on the front of the crystal LED, how much is due to the image that was shot by uh, Adam Wilt, which was a 14 element lens. But HDR, it's kind of interesting for lenses. Here's a typical zoom lens with 36 pieces of glass, which means it's got 72 surfaces, and if there's 99% transmission per surface, only 48% of the light is getting transmitted. And the other 52% is floating around in the lens. Even if you go to 99.8% transmission, then still less than 87% gets transmitted. Um, but if you could reduce that to say 24 pieces of glass, then that could be significantly better and you might get more dynamic range out of that. Uh, so this was kind of interesting at the show. This was something that Canon came up with and Larry Thorpe, who I think I see in the back, yes, there he is, um, he was showing this and it's a, a new way of doing zoom lenses. Instead of having a two group zoom, you have a multi-element uh, zoom system and they had a pretty small and lightweight zoom lens that was using this technology, so that might be pretty exciting. But here's another lens company, and the issue here is not how good the lenses are, but how many different imaging formats we have. All of the circles that you see are what the lenses can provide. All of the rectangles that you see are sizes of imaging elements. Uh, and there's a lot of different sizes of imaging elements. And one new one, I shouldn't say it's quite new, new to the cinematography field perhaps, is full frame. Full frame is pretty standard for um, SLRs and DSLRs, but now we're starting to see this in cameras from Ari and Canon and Sony and so on. Now I showed you this two years ago. It was HDR up conversion. And on the left, you see an HDR image. In the middle, you see an SDR image. On the right, you see something that's labeled SDR up conversion. It sure isn't turning the SDR into that image on the left. Um, so to me, it was kind of a joke two years ago. But two years have gone by. And Technicolor did a demonstration of their up conversion at the HPA Tech Retreat in February. And I looked at it, and I looked at it, and I looked at it. And I think I must have spent at least half an hour over the course of several days looking at it. I could not see anything wrong. So if that's the case, do we have to produce in HDR or can we upconvert? I'm not saying, but I will tell you that there is a special offer on this month only from a different company, ISO Video, which also has both up and down conversions. If you contact them and if they haven't run out of the 100 that they've offered yet, um, they will do either an up or down conversion for you for free. I apologize for the quality of this image, but the uh, idea you will get, um, now that we have democratized video so much, anyone can shoot anything. So here's a giant screen that NAB was uh, showing in their main lobby, and it was an image of a podcast, and you can see one of the people on the right. The second person is um, facing that person, so you're not going to see that person's face. The third person has her face completely obscured by a mic boom. And they just stayed on this shot for something like half an hour. Now, in the old days, when cameras were very expensive, you had to be taught how to use them. Um, artificial intelligence, here's the AI experiential zone. 
and you can see how interested people were in that. Um, but saying, you know, we have AI, it's like saying, oh yes, you know, our device uses wires. Um, there's all kinds of things that you can do with AI. And some of the things, voice recognition, image recognition, voice reconstruction, image reconstruction, technical adjustment, gives you faster workflow, easier versioning, maybe loss of jobs because of that, easier fixes, maybe fake news because of that. Um, here is IBM talking about their closed captioning based on um, Watson's AI, which actually works quite well. Uh, I showed you this last year. This was facial recognition. It identifies Justin Timberlake and uh, Christopher Walken in the image, but then there was this story in the New York Times. Facial recognition is accurate if you're a white guy. So here's someone who is not a white guy. Um, this, was, this is former President Obama, and if you haven't been to this website before, I really urge you to go there, futureoffakenews.com, and you will see former President Obama giving a speech that he did not give. But his mouth is moving, his eyes are doing things, his voice sounds exactly like he gave it. Um, artificial intelligence technology is doing that kind of stuff, and so uh, Trump once said the Access Hollywood tape was real, and now he's not so sure. And there's a book on the right, uh, Government Criminals and Adobe Voco. Adobe Voco is something that if you feed it something like 40 minutes of someone talking, they can make that person say anything. Here's Adobe's Creative Cloud, and they're starting to introduce AI features, like uh, they can match the color on cameras, also do audio ducking, motion graphics, and so on. And like uh, any addictive substance, first they give it to you for free in school, and then you become addicted for life. Cinematographers are not so sure this is a wonderful thing. Uh, last year I showed you this, this gigantic crane on top of a car. The car did not have any stabilizing element, so as the crane moves, the car is going to move also. There were more of those at the show, but there were some interesting camera mounts. This is telemetrics with a pedestal, but the pedestal doesn't have wheels, it has balls so it can move instantly in any direction. Doesn't require steering. Um, this was a company that was showing you all the injuries you can get from hand-holding a camera without their wonderful brace, uh, steady gum. Uh, so posture becomes an issue. And then here was just a sort of plain old ordinary tripod, but done very, very well, Sackler and Vinton's Flotec. This is probably the oldest exhibitor at NAB, uh, Photon Beard, founded in 1882, certainly the most truthful exhibitor in its name. Definitely photons there, definitely a beard. Um, here's a report by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the Oscar people, on the introduction of incandescent illumination to movie making in 1928. And what's that going to mean? Well, when LEDs started taking over from incandescent, uh, it was the same kind of thing, it was just a new technology, but now we can start looking into possibilities. So there's an umbrella light up at the top there, but there's no light shooting into the umbrella. And in fact, you can take away the umbrella part and it'll still work almost as good. And then that piece of fabric down at the bottom, that's a lighting instrument from Xilite. It's a piece of fabric with LEDs all over it. These didn't really fit into anything else, but I thought they were kind of cool. Uh, Rochester Institute of Technology looking into chromatic noise perception. Um, is color filtering giving us something that we treat differently than we treat other noise? And then I love this little radio station that you can knock together with either a solar panel or a windmill. And then finally, uh, very pleasing. This is the sign at the NPR distribution services, but there were signs like this all over the show floor. Uh, engineers wanted, we are hiring. And now I will be happy to take questions, and these slides again are available right now online at bit.ly slash bbtb hyphen 18. Say it again. <laughs> bit.ly slash bbtb bits by the bay hyphen 18. Yes. I always have some kind of question. Going back to your much earlier thing about the different compression types in Apple's new uh, ProRes RAW, mm -hmm. I've been telling some of my clients that I worry about ProRes. I'm just wondering if you have any 
opinion or view or inside information on whether we think this has really got longevity. I mean, c based on Apple's uh, tendency to just decide we're going to get out of such and such a business. I mean, it's proprietary. Uh, it is proprietary, and Apple could get out of it. Um, but it's conceivable that since there are other companies like Atomos who are in it, their contract might say that if Apple gets out, they continue to keep it going. Um, I don't have much to report. I did not spend much time at the show looking into it. As you saw, there, were an in there was an increase in exhibitors, more than 1,700 exhibitors, and I do stop by every one of them, so I don't spend a lot of time at any of them. Other questions? Okay, well, I have brought you back to time and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your meeting and I loved what I heard this morning. Thanks very much.